already. Yes. Yes. And I'm the youngest. And Jane in the middle here. So it's Jane Lansbury and Sharon Fisher. And um, I'll tell you a little bit of, about um, about how the how the book came about. But I do. If it, what are people at home seeing, Bill? Now, just what's on the screen. Okay, so I can stand up. And I'm not going to dis disrupt anything. Um, I've got an interest. This is this is somewhat um, bittersweet for me to uh, to visit uh, Lod home here. I've got a, a history here. I haven't been here for ages and ages. I was much much younger. I had um, not only I had dark hair, I, I had hair uh, the last <laughs> time I, I was here. But I was going to uh, back in the eighties. Uh, I was going to uh, to USM, and um, I, I got interested in watching hawks. And I found a book in the library. I was supposed to be doing some other studies, but I found a book in the library by Don Heinzelman, some of you might be familiar with him. He wrote uh, a, a field guide to hawk watching spots. And I can remember sitting down on the floor in the library at, at USM, uh, flipping through the pages, you know, to where I might find a place to watch hawks and Mount Agamemnon come up, came up. And it looked like a great spot, even though I couldn't pronounce the, you know, couldn't pronounce the name. And uh, so I, I told my girlfriend at, at the time, you know, this weekend I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm, I'm gonna get my studying done with it. And I'm gonna go to this Mount Agamemnicus, and you know, let's go. So we we drove up to the top, never been there before, and there was this cluster of of folks, and um, they were sitting. There was a big picnic table, or two picnic tables together, and they were just staring off into you know the void. And so I stood off to the stood off to the side, and. Um, and someone said, oh, here comes one. This one, you know, it's come like over, over Tower 3 or whatever we were using. And uh, and uh, so someone yelled out, oh, yeah, it's a sharp shin hawk. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, okay, that's a sharp shin hawk. And, you know, and then a few minutes later, there was a kestrel that came by. So this was the routine that many of you have, have experienced. And so I ended up going there regularly. And I, you know, I befriended this one. I mean, they took me in under their, their wing. And after the second or third time I was there, I remember June Ficker. Now, probably many of you knew knew June. Uh, she said, uh, "Oh, here's a here's a sharpshin coming in," and I, I sort of, uh, you know, just voiced. I, I I was trying to figure out, you know, why that was a sharpshin because it looked like a kestrel to me. And I, I said, "Kyle, why isn't that a, a, a kestrel?" And the thing came in closer and closer, and there was silence. And someone said, we've got to get rid of this kid. It was a kestrel that came in. And June, June was, she was wonderful about it. She said, yeah, sometimes, you know, sharp chins turn into kestrels. You know, that was <laughs> but she was just wonderful to me. And we became the, the best of friends with all of those folks. And it's bittersweet because most of them have passed on. Uh, the gang, that wonderful, wonderful gang. I remember I got really involved. And I, um, uh, at the time, honestly, you couldn't buy an owl decoy. And I had read that owl decoys are great for you know attracting birds to, to come in and you couldn't buy one. So I took a, a piece of firewood, uh, just about owl size, and I got a feather duster at uh, a store that they don't even have them anymore, Ames. Um, and I took this feather duster apart and pasted it all over. And I had uh, my uncle who was a wood carver, he, um, he carved the nose and he carved the, the the, the facial discs around the eyes and put, you know, some, some feathers up, up like this. And I brought it up and, you know, everyone looked at it and laughed and so forth. And so it sat on the table there and it was really slow. And one of, one of the guys uh, might've been Rich Aiken. Um, some of you might know, know Rich. Um, he, uh, he's still alive, fortunately. He said, why don't we put the owl up? You know? So we put, we put the owl up and nothing was coming in near it. But all the people that were coming by would look at us and were staring up at this thing. It was it was like a shrine, and people thought it was some kind of a cult. And someone came over and said, "You know what? What's going? What's going on here? You know what? what what's happening?" And um, and we did have birds that came in, and so that became the thing. You know, I'd get there, we'd have a cup of coffee, and someone would say, "Hey, why don't you get the owl out? Why don't you uh, why don't you bring the owl out?" And uh, so that uh, so that was that was great, and. Uh, so that was my introduction to York County Audubon because they were York County Audubon. And 
Uh, we used to have our meetings at the uh, Webb Hannett uh, Women's uh, Club, I think. You know, it was before before any of this happened here. I, I ended up um, getting really involved and in getting, you know, getting a, a graduate degree after, you know, I really was tutored by these uh, these these wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, Rena Cody. Anyone remember Rena's name? She was she was involved with the uh, Hawk Migration Association of New England. Um, and Phyllis Ravensey, uh, Rich Aiken was was one. Uh, Denny Abbott, who's uh, passed away, he was he was really. Uh, um, Davis Finch also was up there. Davis used to stay long. Davis had this weird. Some of you real recognize his name, right? Um, I would think I would think you might. Um, he had this this strange quirk that he he always liked to leave on the hour. He was keeping notes, and he always liked so. So we'd say, okay, you know, another 10 minutes and we'll go. And then we had a we had a flurry of birds come through and it's now it's 15 past. And he'd say, well, you know, why don't we wait? And I I was anxious to just just learn whatever he and so he would describe all the little details of uh, of these birds coming in, uh, which really shaped the way uh, the way I birded, the way I, I looked at uh, looked at things. And uh, it was it was just a, a, a marvelous time in my life. Uh, to be just welcomed in and taken by this group. I became the program director uh, for York County Audubon for a number of years. They sent me, I, I was um, uh, one of the scholarship recipients and, and I saw on your website, you still do that? That is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. That changed, that absolutely changed my life. This, this place right here changed my life without question. It was 1983. Believe it or not, 1983, um, our dad had just passed away and I was scheduled to go. And I said, ah, you know, I don't feel like going. And everyone said, yeah, go, you know, just go and go and uh, and uh, and it will be it'll be good for you. And right after that, someone suggested a, a, a graduate school and I went into that program. And it totally, totally changed, changed my life. So little things make a make a big, big, uh, big difference. I ended up going back to Hog Island as an instructor. For a number of years, and became a director of couple of couple of their programs there after graduate school, and I'm still in quite um, close contact with Steve Kress, who probably many of you uh, many of you know. And uh, and again, that was it was all connected. Um, we used to have wonderful parties after the. Um, I mean, it's all about the parties, really. You know, the birding stuff is, but but after the Christmas bird counts, uh, Rena Cody ran the one. Um, uh, there were two of them. There was the uh, Kenny Bunk count and then the York count, I think, if I remember right. And those were just so, so exciting. Then we'd get together afterwards uh, for cocktails and counting. And we always, you know, counted double uh, after, you know, after a few. Any, anyway, I just wanted you to know that, that you know, it's a homecoming. It's a homecoming uh, uh, to be here. And I was thrilled to see on your, um, on your website that you have a youth program because, we all need our replacements, right? I mean, to be doing this kind of stuff, and that's what uh, that really is uh, is is what it's what it's all about. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be able to share this new book that um, that my uh, sisters and myself have put together, and maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll talk a, a little bit a little bit about that. <laughs> The best laid plans, but we're back to square one with um, with this not going any forward here. I can't advance the slides. Um, so can we have a minute to just sure. try to juggle this yeah. around? Do you know any jokes, Bill, that you can tell? Any, any bird jokes? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't have one. At well, I just hope my checkbook doesn't come up when I start fooling around here um, with uh, with this. <laughs> I might have to cut out of the Zoom. Would that shut everything down? Maybe I'll... Right, and I and 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 then we got it to where it worked, and um, and then I think Bill got involved and changed something. I you know, he's the president. He get away. He can get away with that. Um, 
Apparently not. Back to meeting. It was a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good. It's good. Thank you, Bill, for uh, for solving uh, solving that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it. I guess it must. Uh, I guess it must have been. Um, so, so we're really excited about this book and. You know, it's it's kind of the mutual admiration society. The three of us when we get to get together. Uh, Sharon just uh, uh, sent me an email last week, and she said, "God, I reread chapter three, and God, that is really good." You know? <laughs> so we were talking. We were we were talking about uh, putting her her review on the back cover the next time we we have it have it printed. But um, but it, <laughs> yeah, and I'll I'll sit back down in the when I. I get less excited here in, in a second. So I just wanted to, the, the book really evolved um, surprisingly in a direction that we didn't we didn't expect. I started out working on uh, on some things, pulling some things together um, because you know I had I had a perspective on what I wanted to uh, to share with people. And uh, I brought Sharon in who's who's always been a great writer. She's always, a uh, proofread of uh, any of you know any of my school papers that I had to I had to go through, and she's 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 really good at that. Um, there are other things that she could use a little improvement with, but <laughs> but she's she's good she's good at that. And she had a great suggestion after we had had a couple of sessions. We got we got together, and she said we really need to bring Jane in on on this. And Jane has so the three of us have very different perspectives on things, and surprisingly. Um, there were very few fisticuffs is involved with uh, with pulling this together, and we we uh, we we met weekly, and it turned out to be just a wonderful time, and the whole project took on a direction of its own. Um, it's it's all of us, uh, the three of us, put together, and um, and we would go through and we'd say, who wrote that, and. One of us, you know, Sharon would always say, "Yeah, that was me. I wrote that." You know, and this it wasn't wasn't true. You know, it's you know, it's, it, it was uh, always always a question. So the point being that we we grew up in the same family, we had the same parents, we lived on the same street, we had the same experiences, but we had very different perspectives. But we agreed on uh, on the, the entire theme of of, of what we uh, what we have here. We grew up north of Boston. You, probably surprised to hear that I'm from Boston, you know. And uh, the other day I said this to a group of people and someone said, no kidding, you know, <laughs> after I had, I had started. And we had a summer home. We were fortunate enough to have a summer home in Effingham, New Hampshire. Uh, it was about, at the time, it was about three hours north of Boston that we came to uh, every Friday. Uh, my, is, we were ready to go. And my dad got out of, out of work and we would get in the car and we'd drive up to the bungalow, which is what you're you're seeing here, totally changed uh, our our lives. Just a great experience. Um, we we came out of the city, and were saturated in this other world. And I I remember, you know, I'd get out of the vehicle, and I wouldn't even go into the house. And I ran out. There was a wonderful brook that I could play in, and I never knew that other people knew all the things that I was finding under rocks and under the bank and. And uh, I, I never knew that. And I, I didn't have to know anything else. I didn't have to know the names of any of these things. It was just a great experience without, without any technical um, involvement at all. And Jane and Sharon had the same experience. Then we'd go back Sunday night, we'd go back into the city and this totally changed our, our lives. It was a saturation and then a back to, to somewhat normal, normal life, which evolved uh, so that we carried Whatever we gained in the country, we carried back in our in our lives, and it totally it totally changed uh, totally changed us. <clears throat> the The book, uh, the science of watching and the art of seeing and the power of nature absorption, mm -hmm. it uh, it 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 highlights uh, awareness, our awareness with the natural world, 
And I think it's an opportunity for us to uh, to enhance whatever whatever we're doing in the natural world. And for me, bird watching was that direct you know highway right into right into nature. And it's expanded to a lot of things uh, since since then. The point being, there are a lot of books. There are a lot of books about uh, nature. There are field guides. There are, there are behavior guides. There are, there are guides about mammals. There are guides about birds, insects, and a lot of different books about nature. This book is about you, the watcher. It, it's what this experience does to us. And we coined the term nature absorption. Um, some of you might, might be familiar with Richard Louv's um, really well-known book, Last Child in the Woods, where he coins the term um, nature deficit disorder, which um, he was seeing in, in many children that weren't having the experience that, that we were having growing up. Um, kids don't play out as much as they, they used to, whether you're in the country or you're in the city, they don't play out as much. And he, he rightly so, I believe, saw that this was, a, this was a, a deficit. He also talked about vitamin N, nature, as far as a, a, way, to, um, uh, a way to just be healthy. So, so our spin on, on some of that um, with nature absorption was you don't have to have any deficit to start with. You might already, you know, have uh, experience out in nature, but that can be that can be enhanced um, with a change of perspectives. Uh, there's a th there's a, a a knowledge that can be gained. We all know about going to school, and and you can learn about uh, geography, or you can learn about calculus. Uh, there's, there, there are many things. So you can have a tutor, like I had here, where someone at the top of Mount Agamemnicus would would say, "This is what you want to look for. You want to look for the, you know, the 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 cadence of the beat of these birds, even from such a distance." And that's a great aid. It's not diagnostic of an exact field mark, but that's you put that together with how the bird is flying and the shape of the wings, if it's a dihedral or if it's flat. Um, uh, so you can learn a lot of things that way, but there's another type of, of knowledge that can be gained more along the lines of, of um, the, way, uh, the way heat is transferred, uh, the way sound is transferred, the way light is transferred. There's something that happens to us, not on the cerebral level that we, uh, that we experience when we uh, saturate or just look in the direction of, uh, of nature. If I could just yeah. interrupt for a minute, I'm just going to read a little section of, of the book. It might make it a, a there is knowledge that can be, I'm sorry. I'll turn, I'll turn it around. There is knowledge that can be taught, like history or geography, which instills an appreciation for and an understanding of the subject. But there is another kind of knowledge that only can be transmitted in a similar way, as Chris said, like light or heat is transmitted. It is the second type of knowledge that comes through affinity with nature that actually arouses an innate way of thinking, an opening of the heart. Nature transmits a subtle and potent energy that can be absorbed by us, nature absorption, bringing about physical, mental, and spiritual transformations. And, and these changes lead to harmony uh, on many levels. I just thought that might explain it. A little that's, bit. A, that's okay you can interrupt me this this time but <laughs> so um we just have a few a few slides want to go through and um and then we'll we'll finish the slides with the the table of contents and then hopefully we can have uh, we can have a discussion about some of the things that might 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 be provocative to you um uh the the science of watching um there is a there is a science there is a science to uh, to this that I'd like to just go through and and those of you that are bird watchers will will under, will un understand this. Um, I'm going to quickly go through a, a, a few things. We we see an object 
of um, there, there, and, and and what we talk about in the book is really practical. I mean, it's not this. It's yeah. not just you know, hey, tree hugging, um, you know, and that makes you feel better. But I mean, that's good to do. But it's not just. It's not just that. So we see uh, an object uh, when we're we're walking around, whether we're bird watching or not. But we're in nature. We see an object, um, and we don't know what it is. So we we explore it, and there are a number of different ways to uh, to explore it. Uh, we can use a field guide if it's a bird like that rose-breasted grosbeak there. Um, we're so blessed now with uh, what's available. Um, I don't know if any of you have birded in South America or not, but you know the field guides there. Some of the field guides don't have any uh, drawings or photographs. They're just narratives about what the bird is. Which which is can be really challenging, of course, um, but we're blessed. We have I don't know. You could probably name ten or fifteen wonderful, sophisticated field guides uh, that keep getting updated. And now we even have it. You know, we even have it on our our phone. Um, field guides that you, you even can just take a picture with Merlin, and it'll tell you what what the bird is. And that's a first step. The the identification. Uh, the birds don't even know their names. But if we can get a label onto that and agree with other people that have the same label, then we can quickly find out a lot about that uh, that little bundle of feathers that we're we're looking at. So, um, and and this this um, uh, field guides and range maps and habitat and food and behavior. These are the way we we identify birds now. It's not just based on field guides. The the Peterson system is still kind of the basis of that with the field marks. But we're, we've become so sophisticated that people that have never bird watched before can take some of the tools that are available and really catapult themselves into um, a, a, a level of great appreciation of what they're what they're seeing based upon the tools that uh, that they have. So so we look at this thing and and we figure out what it is and we identify it uh, based upon whatever criteria we're, we're using. And that leads to a, an awareness and an increase in our awareness. And that enriches the whole experience, right? I mean, this is nothing new. This is just what uh, what we all, This is, maybe maybe you don't dissect it like this, but this is what we, we experience. So the overall uh, observation is, is experienced. And we find that now our vision has been refined. After we've looked at this and we, now you can see it, you can see it again, and you no longer identify that rose-breasted grosbeak, you recognize it. It's a different experience. It's an enriched experience. Um, you don't, you, and it's just like seeing someone, someone that, uh, that you met last week um, that, you know, has blonde hair and, and wears a dark coat. Um, you, you no longer go through all of those details and that experience is is very much uh, changed, and the whole exploration of this is enhanced, uh, which increases our awareness. Not just for that experience, but overall, it increases our awareness. We're a little bit sharper uh, with our observations, and that then the experience is enriched. The awareness continues. It's this this spiraling in a in a positive increase awareness direction. To the point where the knowledge is structured in your consciousness. It's it's not this um, this step by step when looking at field guides and and so forth. That totally changes what what goes on, and it enriches our lives, both observing and back. It's like being in the country and back into the city. It changes both uh, both aspects uh, to that. And and it's like um, uh, Thoreau said it. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And when you have the scientific facts and, and you also introduce a spiritual aspect of this, which we haven't spoken about yet, but um, it, it just gives you a different perspective and awareness of, of the sacred all around us of which we're a part. That's part of that increase in, in awareness. You start to see more of the reality. I mean, this is what we're already, you're already doing this, but by stepping back and seeing that, I, I think there's an aid it, that, that it enhances what, what's going on. You, real, you, realize, you realize that. And, and I think one thing we were um, 
thinking about is how wonderful, and all of you know this, how wonderful it makes you feel when you're out in nature. When you know, you feel it, and that's the nature absorption. And the more we have of that, of course, the better we feel I, completely, you know, not, not just uh, and that's briefly. We, we, yeah. we liken it to like an opening of the heart, you know, through your emotions. That's one way you um, enhance your awareness of what is happening. Not, not so much a cerebral connection, but, but really an emotional connection. And often nature will reveal itself as a, as a unity, a harmony that we, we really can't enter into with our um, cerebral alone, you know? It has to be an opening of the heart through our emotions. We need 200%. You know, we, we, we need an enlivening of the 100% the of, of what we're, we're experiencing and then 100% of what is the experiencer. Uh, and, and that is something that it's effortless. And to be aware of that, um, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful experience. Now I didn't put this photo in here just, just for you, although you, were, <laughs> you were recently there and it, it has snow on it. Uh, now everyone is familiar with, uh, Mount Washington. This is, this is our back, back, backyard here. And we do talk about, uh, we have a chapter in the book on travel because this enhances our awareness. Uh, I've been dealing with, um, fall foliage tours, uh, New England fall foliage tours. It's a big part of my my business, and I I see uh, groups um, you know daily that are, that are coming through, and they're in a different perspective. Uh, they they are heightened. They're they're traveling. They're aware. They you know you you mention a you know a sugar maple orange leaf, and they're, oh they're thrilled. They're yelling. Oh gosh, sugar maples. You know it's a big it's a big deal uh, for them because they're in that that travel mode. And you've all you've all traveled, and and that increases our our awareness. We're we're wide eyed when we're we're doing that, and we can be wide eyed in our own backyard, um, places like Mount Washington. I mean, it's a stone's throw away, and you were just hiking in the in the in the mountains there, and that's a, that's a, a wonderful experience. You had something, Sharon? Yes. Well, I, I was just going to say that um, in this time that we live in right now more than ever we th we think we we need to stay connected in in a very deep way with nature people are on their phones on their computers kids don't play outside as much they're on their phones we're removed and um from part of us because we forget um that we're so much a part of nature. We are actually a part of all of this. We're not separate. Even though um, uh, somebody once said, um, we are nature's way of looking at herself, but it's like looking in a mirror. We are actually connected as we all know. We just have to remember it. The book is about not not telling us something, but reminding us. And um, being separate uh, from the natural world, we, we get anxious. That all that angst people have nowadays and this, you know, kind of frenetic stuff, we all feel it's all around us. Nature doesn't feel that way. Um, in the book, we, we've included a lot of poetry uh, from different times, and um, much of it is, is uh, well-known classical poetry about nature. And, and we did that um, because, uh, as Jane was saying, um, we, we need the heart. As, as well as the head and with poetry, with the rhythm and powerful word combinations, um, it, it often evokes the imagination and it, it, uh, it, it triggers an emotional response to whatever we're reading, whatever's happening. So we have the heart and the mind 
And uh, we just have to keep being reminded that we need nature and that kids need nature. And so uh, we, we have suggestions in the book about, do you want to read that, Jay? Oh, whatever. No, no, please go ahead. Let me just say one, one more thing. Our original title for the book was Birding with God. And that was our working title right up until until it was uh, printing, and I thought that was such a clever title. I, I had I had trouble letting letting go of that. But we made our first you know I had to battle with these two, uh, but we made our first chapter "Birding with God," but it made sense because it, everyone we have we have a, a, a different conception of of God, and every, I think every everyone has a, a different uh, perception of God. Uh, God has many names and no name. Uh, so, uh, but the theme of, of the book definitely um, approaches that spiritual that spiritual level. Uh, shall I read the other yeah, one? Yeah, I want you to do that. Um, no matter where we are, nature is there all around us, within and without, seeking our attention. We need a different perspective to hear this calling. A change of perspective leads to a change in perception. Nature absorption is a path of intuition, healing and spiritual transformation. Enter into the natural world in order for the energies, the power of nature to enter into you. There is a divine living presence in the natural world that resonates with the living spirit within each of us. We are not alone, even in our solitude. So um, let's take a, a quick look at the, um, at the table of contents and then we can, we can, discuss anything that you, if you have um, you have any any questions here um so as i said birding with god was the, the the first chapter and we have some narratives we have some narratives that we wrote uh separately about our own connections with with nature to bring out um some of some of the ideas that we we wanted to present um uh the the science of watching and the art of seeing uh chapter three we we go into details of of step by step uh, ways to enhance our experience with with nature. If, if 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 you don't think you you need any you know step by step, it's it it's it's positive to just see that see that happening. And this is something that happens on its own. Um, this it, it just happens on its own. It's nothing that you have to um, get better better at as you as you move along. Um, uh, chapter four was. Uh, you know, changing perspectives, uh, some really mechanical tools that um, Sharon's always been uh, 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 journaling. And that does something. T talk about that, Sharon, a little bit. You know, what goes on in your, you know, the left brain, right brain type? Oh, well, um, when you, probably many of you already know this, but when you write, it's considered, if you write cursive primarily, it, it's a, uh, um, a form of drawing which taps into your right right brain and um a, and so that's that's more of a heart more more creative more open in a different way from from your left brain which of course we, we need both journaling also makes us aware of, of the day you know you take note you don't you don't miss a few days because you've been so busy and so forth and not noticed. Oh yes, oh my goodness, my oak tree is golden. You know, if if you do nature journaling or 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 weather journaling, you take note every day. It's just a little tiny tool to help remind us notice what's happening in nature around us. Take a look. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Our life lists are somewhat along the same lines. Those of you that keep a, a bird life list, uh, you, I mean, it's simple. It's, it's no long narrative of journaling, but to be able to reflect back where you, you first saw such and such a bird, um, there's some connection there, and it's it's a way to order your, your experiences. <clears throat> um, uh, chapter five is about the seasons, and 
you know, as we we live in New England here, it's awesome. It's like traveling. You don't have to go anywhere. And it's different. Every time you look out the window, it's a different experience there. So we highlight, uh, we've highlighted some of some of that. And we have some narratives in uh, in this chapter. And of course, I mentioned um, travel and and uh, <clears throat> we have some narratives here uh, talking about different travel uh, travel experiences. Then we have section two in um, in the book uh, that we have uh, nature encounters for families. Um, people would would ask us, well, what should I do? You know, I, I, I buy into the idea of this, but, you know, what can I do to enhance this uh, to to uh, to experience it a little bit more? So we have some some uh, some really good uh encounters with nature that you can do individually you can you can do with a friend you can do with a family with children um uh, there's no restriction on on age or, or numbers that you can uh, you can you can you can do when i was at when i was at hog island i developed um one of these encounters call, calling the um uh that i that i called the the science of watching and it was a behavior. It was a behavior study that that I've fine tuned and and lengthened and and um, and brought it to light. But it was very successful with people people that were experienced birders, but uh, they were good at identifying. But they often didn't stop to to watch the bird to see the behavior to kind of absorb what's what's going on. And this was a, a simple technique prescribed how to and it changes not just the bird watching aspect it changes the aspect all it just your awareness or overall um and be, be, just before we get into a discussion um i i'd like to just uh mention these these two quotes uh well rachel carson emphasized that nothing exists alone in nature and John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else. And that's us too. We're part and part, but we're absolutely part of, of the natural world. That's why we feel at home in the natural world. And all of the angst of the world isn't happening to the trees around us. And when we're there, we start like, like tuning box, Chris always likes to say, like, um, Chris, explain, explain well, about that. Every, every high school um, physics class, two tuning forks that, that you have that are the same length, same frequency, and you vibrate one, and hold it beside the other one, that one will vibrate at the same frequency. So that that's what happens. There is a definite vibration in nature. And it, we're speaking to the choir here, you know, um, uh, that, uh, but but it, it it's helpful to, to see this in print or experience it. Um, I think it enhances the experience uh, some, somewhat. And so the joy and the, the peace that is out there right now starts to to vibrate in us you know and that's nature absorption the, the the more we put ourselves in a position where we can be tuned by nature and and the more we gain and, um, any um any comments from the gang out in zoom land or uh or you folks here, all nature absorbed, sound asleep in the back row there. <laughs> are they positive comments or? Are... Yeah, typically it the 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 state line doesn't interfere much with, with what we're we're talking about. Chris lives in New Hampshire. We live in Maine. <laughs> I wish I lived in Maine. Um, where I live, you have to drive into Maine and then back into. There are no roads to my house from New Hampshire. We're going to keep it that. 
keep it that way. And we all live very close to each other, even though we're <laughs> Yeah, that this this is something I I wrote a, a while ago. Birding at Fenway is one of the one of the narratives, uh, personal narratives that I that I uh, contributed. I uh, I went to a game in Fenway um, with my nephew, and it was it was an unusual timing uh, of the game. It was uh, uh, later in the afternoon, but earlier so that it was still light for some reason. I forget what the story was. And then we had a rain delay too. But Fenway Park, is it, it uh, has everyone been to Fenway Park here? I can just assume, assume that, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's this magical, this magical place. It always has been, you know, when I was a kid, you know, my dad took me for the first time and I can remember walking up one of those, one of those, what do they call like a tunnel thing. And uh, it was, it was, I was so excited. He was going to, I'd watch the games on television and so forth. We, he's actually taking me and I'll walk into the place. And I looked at him and I said, are you kidding? Is this it? <laughs> it was in color. I had only seen it in black and white. I thought he was fooling me. I thought he'd taken me someplace else. It was, I thought he was playing a joke on, on me. And it was so, it was so exciting. So I, I went, went, I'd been to hundreds of games as a kid. We skip school, we go in 75 cents to sit in the bleachers. Unbelievable. And no reserved seats out there. You got there early, you could say 75 cents. And then, and then if you had a quarter of Coke and a, you, know, you had a buck and a half, you'd get a slice of pizza and, and ride the MTA. That's all you, all you needed. It was just a great experience. And the old folks in the stands, um, the old guys that were there every single day, because it was, Inexpensive, yeah, it was cheap. Um, they would teach us how to how to score. So we'd get there. And we knew the guys. We didn't know their names, but it was always the same, you know, the same group out there. And they'd teach us how to score. It was just a, a one of those magical experiences that you look you look back on. So in in uh, more recent years, I um I decided that I was going to keep track of all the birds that I, that I saw. And it's located in in the the back bay fence, which is it's the muddy river that comes comes through there, and the fence is you know it's a freshwater marsh, and it's perfect for bird watching. It's just absolutely perfect, and I'd be watching the birds and the games going on, and so that's what the that's what the narrative is, is about. And I think I think we it must have been a good day. Um, I think there were thirteen or fourteen different species. Um, including a peregrine falcon that zoomed across. I was the only the only only one out of three thousand people or thirty five hundred people that 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 noticed this bird. They were all watching this foolish game. I mean, the peregrine falcon, you know, <laughs> coming coming through. Um, uh, we had a a, a, a night heron. Uh, I can't remember if it was black or yellow uh, that that flew through and. And all the birds, of course, the 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 city birds that are there for the leftover popcorn uh, were very active. So I really like that um, uh, that uh, the, that description. Oops. Uh oh. Back on track, I hope. Oh, yes. maybe. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. We lost, okay. we lost the screen, but we're we're all all done with that, all right? Been doing a little, just did a little research, and I, I can share with all of us that uh, Fenway is a hot, the Angry hot spot. Oh, really? Huh? 42 species. Wow. Wow. Well, I'd be interested. I'll have to look at that and see see what other ones are um, have been seen yeah what i've what i've missed there used to be a red tail hawk that would that would stay right on one of the light platforms uh there and that was always exciting and no one else is looking at this thing and every once in a while it would come out it would fly, fly around over the over the infield and you know go back to its uh, go back to its perch so it's it, it, it's good i'm always surprised and and not surprised at the amount of um city birds 
that you can uh, that you can see that you kind of think you know you'd, you'd see more outside of, of the city. Yes. Do you ever share the uh, Indian legend? Um, oh, oh, is that about the the oaks? E it, oh, it, oh, oaks and the beaches. Yeah, it's, it's the, that. There, no, it's the very end of the end of the book. Yes, Chris, yes. you tell that story well. Um, I think if it's this, if it's the same one I'm I'm thinking yeah. about. So the so the oak oak trees, um, are marcescent that we we all know they they um they're one of the few trees that hold their leaves after they after they wither marcescent means to wither we have oaks and beeches uh and they're um they're both marcescent hop hornbeam also is a marcescent tree but doesn't doesn't really um dominate in, in our forest so the explanation um of why they hold on to their leaves they're probably have a more southern origin and have marched into the the northern latitudes and not been able to completely seal off that to to cut that 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 leaf off. Whereas our other trees, uh, there's a layer of corky cells around the petiole, the stem of the leaf where it attaches to the tree. These as the days get shorter and shorter, the um, the trees produce hormones, chemicals that cause this layer of corky cells to swell and choke each leaf off like a, like a tourniquet. And the, the oaks get choked off too, but they're, the, they're on the latter portion of the ones that change. And then they hold on, they hold on to their leaves sometimes. And, and some species, different species of oaks will hold on to their leaves for a long, a long time. Um, like the so the, tell the tell the legend. Tell the legend. Yeah, I'm getting to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the legend doesn't mean anything unless you know that the oaks. Well, the oaks. I'll talk to you in the ride home. Yes. So uh, if you can you can see an oak uh, five miles away in the winter. You know it's got it still has its leaves. The median strip on the highways often they're they're it's a species of oak. They still have they still hold on to them. So uh, so that's the. That, that's the reason um, that you know botanists will tell. But the real reason why you know why the oaks hold on to their their leaves, um, this was years ago uh, when Native American domi not dominated over over Maine. Um, they uh, they had uh, they had some laws that they adhered to, and one of those was they had uh, specific hunting grounds. They were forbidden, and and they left that to the wildlife. They were very in tune. The Native Americans were very in tune with uh, conservation and what was appropriate, what wasn't appropriate. And there was And there was a young Indian maiden who was in love with this brave. And she pleaded with the forest. They had that com com communion with, with nature, with the trees, with the forest. And she pleaded with them uh, to somehow come up with a plan that would save his life. And the oaks heard her and they decided they would hold on to their leaves until the new leaves came out in the spring. And he was never put to death because of that. So that's the land. Now you can believe you can believe whichever you want, but that makes more sense to me than you know this coming up from the south business. But, I, but I, 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 do I, think I think it shows that indigenous people, people that live close to the earth, and and those of us who travel in the earth, there's a connection there, and in order to pass that knowledge along. Um, they develop stories and we can develop our own stories. Um, but I, I, I do think if you're paying attention like indigenous people and farmers, those that, those that really rely upon uh, the natural world, when you pay attention, uh, you have a whole different feeling and attitude about what is happening all around you. And and that's why the legend is is there. It's 
in the in, it's at the end of the second uh, section of the book with a couple of other myths. Um, we were just encouraging, especially children who love to make up stories, um, encouraging people to write their own myth about something they're observing, something that, that, that's happening. Uh, it, it's another way of um, emotionally being involved with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you could speak to um, when your awareness um, of the science of nature was transcended and you started to see that interconnection with divinity and the sacred, was it a pivotal moment or was this a gradual awareness that grew with your experiences? I, I think for me, it there was a point where there was a recognition that it already was going on, you know? And I mean, it, it, it wasn't, um, it, it was, it was, I was already having that experience, but I became aware of, of that. And I can look back now and, and see back to, to when we were clearly, when we, we went to, as a boy, when I, I went out of the city into the country and then came back, and I talk about this in, in um, someplace in the book. I forget what, what chapter it's in, but talk about this coming back to the city. And eventually, I brought the country back with me. I changed. I, I changed my experience in the in the city. So the trees along our street were now part of you know they were they were part of the the forest. Just to, they were relatives. They were they were this they were you know connected to the ones behind the bungalow. Uh, and and I had that relationship with you know a, a huge white spruce in our backyard at home that I really I really didn't have that relationship before, um, but coming back, I, I brought that I brought that with me. So that was kind of I, I don't know if that answered your question, but it it, um, it it is definitely a transformational, but often reflected upon. I don't know about you two. I, I I agree. It's already there. It's already there for all of us. It's becoming more and more aware. It's waking up. We fall asleep. We forget. We, we need to stay awake. And, and that's why I was saying the book is a reminder. It just wakes us up. Oh, yes. Oh, I, I haven't done that in a long time. I think I'll, I think I'll go take a walk in the moonlight. And um, and, and listen to the different sounds of the night and so forth. The things you already know, you know, things that are even innate, you know, but it's waking up and being aware. And then the more that happens, the more you stay awake. You don't fall asleep quite as easily, but we all do. I go back and read, and, and read the book to get reminded of things all the time. And, and then writes a great review and sends it to us. Boy, I did a good job on that chapter. <laughs> really, when we, it was coming together and talking about these things that we really could feel it. We the book wrote, feel wrote itself. It, 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 it really, it really wrote itself um, and dragged us, dragged us along. And the, the book is dedicated to our brother. We had an older brother uh, who, who died a few years ago and he, um, he was a great influence on, on the three of us. He was an adventurer. He was, he was brilliant. He got, he got all the brains, we always say. He, he was, and he took us, even as kids, on adventures. He was very brave. I was not, but with, as long as I was with him, I wasn't afraid. And, um, uh, and it, it really... Um, and he was a very unique and a very spiritual yes. um, person. And he, um, I couldn't see it when I was younger. He was nine years older than I and even older um, for Chris. And Sharon probably was the closest to him. Um, but um, he, 
he helped us spiritually he did. right where we were, right? Just, just where we, we were individually. And when, when Chris spoke about, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't have the same spiritual, um, well, we don't have the same religious um, concepts, but our experience, our spiritual experiences, I believe have to be the same. Um, uh -huh. You know, it, we experience God, we become aware of, of more of God as, as our relationship with God, how, whatever you want to put there. Um, and, and I just think, um the spiritual aspect of all of life um there's a line in in the book um you might remember it better than than i do that early early on it, it must be in the chapter birding with god that this book won't introduce you to god you already know god you know that this is we're not going to you know try to push anything on any anyone you already have that you already have that experience but it, it can unveil a uh, a, a fresh uh, look at, at what you already at what you already have, and we're we're thrilled with the book. It really it it wrote itself. It it um it it came out better than we better than we expected. It's it's it was an in interesting along these lines an interesting um it was fun. experience. It's so much fun, and and it makes me think. And and the quote is in the book. Einstein um said um. There, I think it was Einstein. Uh, there are two ways to live your life. One is to live it as if there are no miracles. And the other way is, is to live it as if everything is a miracle. And, and the closer we get to nature and, uh, and, and the more we become aware of our connection to it, those are happening all the time. They're happening out there with the leaves I, I, I look at it so differently now. I see, I see the trees and I, I have, I used to think it was beautiful, but oh golly, the winter's almost upon us. Now I look at the leaves and I say to myself, they're celebrating. They worked so hard <laughs> all these months and they're celebrating. Their work is done. They're going to go to sleep and rest until next year. The leaves are dying. <laughs> <laughs> the leaves are dying. He said. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it was John Muir who says, how beautifully the leaves die, full of light and color. That's Sharon always puts a positive up. spin on everything. <laughs> and, and um, yeah. Well, I'll... Uh, Thanks. Any any more questions? Uh, Wonderful comment from a viewer at home. Oh, good. Oh, uh, This viewer is named anonymous attendee. <laughs> uh oh. I think I know him. And learned many things watching nature. The seagulls always face into the wind, so their feathers don't get ruffled. If I always face the challenges in my life, my feathers won't get ruffled either. That's and great. I can make calm progress. Oh, that's that. awesome. Oh, that is so awesome. That's awesome. That's great. That's, that's great. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Yeah. It was a great, thank you. a great audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Be here. So the books are for sale. What is that? The books are for sale. No, you can't. You know, it's good. Yeah. Where are they available for people who are not here? Um, Amazon. They're they're available on Amazon. Uh, just look up um, either uh, any of our names, Chris Louie uh, or uh, Sharon Fisher or Jane Lansbury. Or just by the title, The Science of Watching. It's the only book that has a name like that. Yep. yep. And um, oh, awesome. That'll be that'll that'll be wonderful. And Ava um, can it's they're $28.95, uh, but the sales tax in Maine, right? I think. Okay. So Ava knows the amount of that. Um, she can take credit card.